Says, get that India, big boy. Mike Asimo! Call an ambulance! Maybe call a priest! Oh, what a shot! What a shot! Campbell Killer! Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Tip Sheet Podcast. As always, I'm your host, John, also known as 4020, and it's not really... Proper football, but it's damn near the closest thing possible. So joining me on a week where we get our first proper NRL tier team list are my good mates, 60s and Quint. Fellas, it is, I know we've had a couple of rounds of junior reps and it's been some good football, but it's it's not quite the same itch getting scratched. And it is so good to have an NRL team sheet, even if it is only a trial. How do you feel? I, oh, mate, I'm, I've been champing at the bit because I was at Eels training yesterday. And as you know, once we get into this time of year and there's team lists that are going to happen after the training session, I can't talk about it. I can't put it up mm-hmm. there. So to finally see the team list, which obviously I saw in action at training on Monday, it's a, it's like a weight off my shoulders that I can actually talk about it. <laughs> uh, so I'm happy about that. Uh, but I'm also very curious, fellas, about – how you're coping with all this weather. And and just before I do, I did the Taronga Zoo overnight stay with the Twilight at Taronga concert last Friday night, which was the group ARC, Australian Rock Collective, and it's uh, Cram from Spider Bait, Mark Wilson from Jet, Davey Lane from uh, UMI, and Darren Middleton from Powderfinger. Pretty good ensemble cast. It is. That's Mm. a super group there. Uh, half of the concert was uh, albums that they toured concerts with, which was uh, Beatles' Let It Be and Abbey Road albums. Uh, there was also the Neil Young, I think it was Harvest Moon, and uh, Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. Um, no, I think it was was Dark Side of the Moon or The Wall. Might have been The Wall. Um, anyway, it was the uh, uh, it was a Pink Floyd. Um, segment to the first half of the show the first set second set mate classic absolute classic australian songs and just to give people a bit of an idea about what was on the set list because i i reckon you once you start talking about classic australian songs there's going to be plenty there that people would remember very fondly TNT by ACDC, Streets of Your Town by the Go-Betweens, Alone With You, The Sunny Boys. This is bringing back memories. You're probably too young, fellas, to be honest. <laughs> no, um, I, I, grew, I grew up listening to the classic radio station, so you get a lot, get a lot of his stuff from the Aussie stuff. So, yeah, Well, a, we might have a few listeners that are enjoying this. Never Tear Us Apart in Excess. Yep. History Never mm-hmm. Repeats. Split Ends. Now, they did acknowledge Split Ends as Kiwis, so don't worry <laughs> about that, our New Zealand <laughs> uh, Before Too Long, Paul Kelly. My oh, Happiness, dude. Powder Finger. Now, Darren Middleton actually did that as um, on, on the acoustic guitar by himself. That's nice. So he wrote the song. It was an interesting really? interpretation of that. Because I Love You by the Master's Apprentices. Now, people would recognise uh, that from ads, the chorus of do what you want to do, be what you want to be, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, uh, then uh, I Got You by Split Ends. They got a second appearance. Um, high Voltage. ACDC, a second appearance, I'll Make You Happy, The Easy Beats, and, of course, finishing off with Are You Going to Be My Girl by Jet. Now, speaking of the weather, it rained down on us, sitting on the lawn at Taronga Zoo, and as Clint and I discussed, sometimes when the rain falls on you, you're just going to cop it and go, well, it is what it is. I'm going to get soaked to the skin, so (laughs) be it. So, But, look, a great night, a great gig, and if I can... Encourage anyone to go and see ARC, the Australian Rock Collective. Please go and do so. It's a it's a great show whenever you get to see them. Clint, what about you, mate? How are you coping with the weather or or whatever's been happening in your life? Well, how good is it to have a inverted commas teamless Tuesday uh, finally upon us, gentlemen? But um, yeah, look to, to to be perfectly honest, not good. Um, I said I shared last week uh, uh, my out of control 
um, Zuper Duper addiction, which which got a little bit of feedback. And I I just like to clarify for some of our listeners, they are sugar free. I'm not I'm not destroying the calories. I'm still keeping my health in check. I appreciate the check in with, uh, that I've received from a couple of people. So no, I'm not I'm not burying five six thousand calories in um, in ice box every day. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, geez. Uh, speaking of that rain, well, there was a little bit that hit me this afternoon, and as you said, sixties. I just walked through it and copped it, much like you did on the Friday night. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's just one of those things. Now, fellas, before we go on. Can uh, we just do a, a couple of uh, reminders? First of all, Parramatta Leagues Club, the voting for uh, Leagues Club directors, it's on at the moment. It closes soon. Please get your vote in if you haven't already. Voting electronically is very, very easy. And, uh, yeah, we just encourage everyone to get out there. Um, well, it's not even get out there. Get on your devices Mm -hmm. and vote. And if you received it, the voting uh, papers by mail, again, you do have the option if you if you are online that you can still vote online, even if your email address isn't registered with Parramatta Leagues Club. So you do have the information that allows you to vote online. And if you don't, then, of course, you uh, can vote by post. The more people that vote, the better, because it's more representative of the wishes of the EEL, of the Parramatta Leagues Club membership. And speaking of Parramatta Leagues Club, fellas, just had confirmation that we will be back in 2024 with our live appearances either before or after Parramatta home games this season. We're back in our home away from home in Jack's Bar and Grill. So you can Yay. see there, we'll make sure we put it out nice and early, along with the, the league club, we'll put it out nice and early as well about uh, what time we're appearing, whether it's before or after the game, and also who our legend guest will be. And uh, really looking forward to this. And just a little note going forward, there will be three away games this year where we will be hosting the matches in Paraleague. So if people want to come along, uh, watch some away games with fellow Eels supporters up there in Jacks. We'll be doing it on three occasions this year and really looking forward to getting there and watching games with fellow Eels supporters. So not just watching it on TV at home. These will be interstate games, I should mention. So we're not, you know, it's not as if the game will be down the road at one of the suburban grounds and we're, we're doing a, an away game appearance at, at the Leagues Club, this will be interstate games that we will be uh, there hosting at Paraleagues. So looking forward to seeing you all there at Paraleagues this year. John, over to you, mate. Yeah, before I get an itchy trigger finger and press buttons I shouldn't be pressing, quick shout out to the sponsors of the show, Big Swing Golf, North Mead and Star Partners Real Estate, Auburn, Norellon and Parramatta. Amazing partners for TCT and our podcast, The Tip Sheet. Thanks, fellas, for everything you do. All right, let's get into it. Well, as we just spoke about in our preamble, it is team list Tuesday time. So, John, I'm going to throw it straight to you to take us through the Eels team list for that first trial against the Raiders. Yeah, traditionally, in you know, not just under Brad Arthur, but in general, the Eels and a lot of other NRL clubs have treated the first trial of the season as a not not like a Mickey Mouse game, but giving a lot of you know reserve graders and and fringe guys a run over NRL guys, but. This year, the Eels and a number of teams have really geared up for the opening trial, and the Eels have put together a composite team uh, mixed with you know high caliber NRL players and a whole ton of exciting young prospects. And I, I got to say, it's got me really fired up. This is a quality team list, mm-hmm. and uh, we got you know really you know stable players in the back line and the forward pack alongside all these young players. So uh, taking on the Canberra Raiders, uh, five fifty five p.m. Actually, I thought it was five thirty p.m. So they've moved that time there as the precursor or the, the curtain raiser to the. Uh, Charity Shield out at Cogra. Uh, Oak, it's uh, not Oki Jubilee, uh, Nostrata Jubilee uh, Stadium. Uh, the Eels line up like this. Uh, 60s is sort of uh, talked about this 
in other in, in so many words across the preseason. But Blaze Talungi makes his uh, official debut at fullback. Very excited to see where he goes there. And we'll talk about this one both in this podcast and the preview. On the flanks, Hayes Dunster and Sean Russell. Good to see Hayes getting a start here as he looks to compete uh, for the wing spot again with, uh, with Sean Russell uh, opposite Mike Acevo. Speaking of competition, Morgan Harper and Bowie Simonson get their first shootout, fellas. That's going to be a big one to watch on Saturday. In the halves, Dejan Arcee partners young gun Ethan Sanders, who gets a chance to run the team. It'll be very interesting to see how he can handle those responsibilities. Kai Rodborn off Hickey Ogden will start in the front row with Brennan Hands at dummy half. In the back row, it's a wealth of talent and experience. Uh, Sean Lane, Ryan Madison, well, we know them pretty well. They've been uh, absolute stalwarts of the Parramatta Reels for a number of years now. Kalma Talungi makes his club debut on the edges. And if I'm not mistaken, boys, I know Ryan Madison had the suspension hanging over him, so he needed to play. But I'm pretty certain Lane and Madison played in the corresponding trial last year, didn't they? They've been a bit of a, a fixture in this That's preseason correct. game. So, yeah, not a surprise to see them here. Uh, on the interchange, and it's a big interchange, uh, Luca Moretti, Wiramu Greg, Matt Dury, and Makahesi Makatoa round out what could be an NRL interchange, quite honestly. Uh, keen to see how all four of those players go. Then the extended roster, well, there's a lot of young guns here. Matty Arfa, Tony Mattielli, Joshua Lynn, Charlie Gaima, Dan Keir, Saxon Pryke, Zach Sini, Isaac Lumi and Ethan Martin round out numbers 18 to 26. So it's a big team. Uh, very keen to see how these boys go. They're taking on a, a Canberra Raiders team that has a bit of NRL talent. Um, looking at that, you've got Kotrick, Hopawade, Savage, KO Weeks has played. Ethan Strange is certainly bound for the NRL, although he hasn't really made a name for himself at the top grade yet. Emre Gula, Zach Wolford, uh, I think Sasangi and Mariota have also played a little bit of NRL. Tom mm-hmm. Starling certainly played NRL, and he's on the interchange there as he comes back from uh, a pretty, not through his own fault, I suppose, but a pretty rough season 2023. Um, yeah, so this Canberra Raiders team's got plenty of talent, even if they're lacking in NRL experience across the park, arguably. Um, but yeah, this is a very fun Parramatta team. It's going to be really fired up. Uh, there's a lot of fascinating storylines to watch through this game as it sets the tone for what's coming up ahead in season 2024. We'll see the two young starters in the spine, Talangi and uh, Sanders. Uh, but you got the battles in the wing and centre positions, respectively. And you've got a lot of uh, shaking out of depth uh, sort of battles in the forward pack. The Eels are absolutely stocked up through the middle and on the edges. And how that shakes out into round one and who's playing where is going to be a huge part of his, uh, both this trial and the following trial that happens in, what, about a... Is it the 24th, I think it happens? So there's there's a, a lot to be played out, and it starts on this side there. Yeah, and just to go over then the missing players, well, we've got Jermaine Hopgood, who's involved in the All-Stars game. We've got the spine that hasn't been named in this, that being Gutho, Moses, Brown, and Lussick. Mm-hmm. We've got the three middles in Paulo, RCG, and Offen Gowie. And we've got the outside backs in Sivo and Will Penasini. Bryce Cartwright, too, as well. Oh, sorry. Yes, and Bryce Cartwright. My apologies there. I missed out on uh, Miss Bryce. But yes, so uh, they've been given the rest, and uh, they will obviously be playing in the trial next week. So uh, we can look forward to getting a look at a number of players that I've mentioned in preseason training reports, players that people are very keen to watch themselves. They, they're players that have had a good mention coming through from SG Ball into Jersey Flag or uh, have risen from Jersey Flag to... Uh, the cusp of New South Wales Cup last year. Clint, who are you most keen on watching in this match? The centre battle is something that I'm watching with a very keen eye. You know, it, it seems like every training session that we've had and, and through your report, Sixties, that it swung from Morgan Harper to Bailey Simonson and back and forth again. So, you know, it, it, it'll be a telling um, out, outing for both of them. You'd imagine they both will probably get about 60 minutes out there. Um to really show um, uh, their credentials for, um, for being picked in, in the, uh, the trial next week and, and subsequently round one side. Um, likewise, it'll be really interesting to see how Ethan Sanders goes leading around the senior side. You know, obviously, he didn't um, play anything further than Jersey Flake last year. Um, so this is his first, uh, I, I guess, game in charge of a senior side. 
likewise, you know, you, you see some of the names that are on the interchange bench. You see some of the, the names that are in the, the um, middle forwards there. Um, there's certainly a, a spot or two that's probably still up for um, for grabs in in uh, those battles as well. So, you know, you, all of these little, I guess, um, moments that all exist in this game and, and, and the things that um, the coaching staff are looking out for, um, and they've obviously earned their opportunities through um, training performance, but now it's time to show it in the game. Yeah, look, it's going to be interesting from a combination point of view. Now, I don't expect that when you've got such a mix of players, I'm talking about NRL and mm. New, South, New South Wales Cup or Jersey Flag players playing alongside of them, that, you know, the combinations aren't really going to be as as fluid as, as, fluid as they might be during the season because those players, even though the the training sessions give some exposure of uh, of players to different combinations, you're still talking about training that will primarily be building up uh, NRL combinations and New South Wales Cup combinations. So we've got players that are alongside each other for the first time in uh, in this game. Probably more so from uh, it, with regard to uh, like you've got the the back line that's been named there, and you've got uh, Ethan Sanders uh, playing alongside uh, the first some first grade centres there, for example. Mm. Um, he's he's very familiar with his fullback in Blaze Talungi, but uh, maybe not as familiar um, feeding a pass off to. Um, a Sean Lane or a Ryan Madison or a Kilmer Tuolangi. So it's it's an interesting uh, – it's going to be interesting to watch this. I always like to remind people that when it comes to trials, something like this, you're not really going to be judging what combinations look like. You're probably more no. looking at – you're looking at things like uh, – I mean, and, and also the teams in these trials, they're going to – they're not going to show their hand – in any big way uh, and with so many players in there that are more going to be uh, depth players for the season or they're going to be up and coming players. So uh, what we're seeing is a sign of the depth. We're seeing a bit of a glimpse at a player that's at players that have got potential and might make an NRL debut later on in the season but don't judge the combinations too much because uh, not only will it be fairly new, these combinations, but also, as I said, they're not players that have maybe spent as much time alongside each other in the preseason. So uh, take the trials as you will. We all want to win, of course, and we're all looking forward to seeing how these young blokes go. Um, but, yeah, just just take trials for what they are and enjoy them as a bit mm -hmm. of footy. So, uh, John, anything you'd like to add to uh, the team list before? And I mean, we're gonna we're we're gonna do a bit of a preview. Yeah, we'll go into later depth. in the week. Exactly. Um, I mean, it, your eyes are immediately drawn to the one and the seven. Uh, Blaze Tolling and yep. Ethan Sanders. There's no doubt about it. Ethan, uh, this is going to be the first big step for him, and and it's going to be an interesting journey because right now his future's up in the air. I, I think the odds are stacked against him from staying at Parramatta, but. He's going to be, regardless of how that plays out, and obviously we all want him to stay, he's going to be a big part of the season this year. He's the deputy to Mitchell Moses, and he gets a chance to run a senior team like Clint was saying before. This is a, a huge moment in his career. This is a big stepping stone, so how he does that on Saturday will be fascinating. And Blaze, well, it's been a whirlwind transformation for him. I mean, he started at, mm. off the bench as a utility in the Harold Matthews, but then really you know, solidified into a 5 eighth, And then last year... Uh, in the SG ball, injury, you know, hurt him from, prevented him, hurt him from, you know, establish himself early in the team in that season. And that meant that he was sort of not the odd man out, but he came back into a really strong spine. I mean, it was Arpa Tweedle, fullback, Buds at uh, dummy half, and then you had uh, the, the aforementioned Ethan Sanders as well as Joshua Lynn in the half. So he got uh, bounced out to the centres where he ended up being a superstar. And then from there, he's now at fullback. So the, the sheer talent and the athleticism uh, there is absolutely no question that he can handle the, the responsibilities in that regard. He is a phenom. Um, he is yeah. 
a clear cut NRL like plus 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 player in that regard. But we all know fullback is an incredibly nuanced position uh, in terms of your defensive, offensive positioning, your timing, your communication, your ability to handle a, not just the high ball, but the entire gamut of kicks, grubber kicks, uh, you know, bending like uh, the Cooper Cronk, Andrew John's bending kick, all that sort of stuff. He's going to get the full array thrown at him in the course of his journey, but it's hard not to be so excited for this because he is phenomenally talented, immensely talented, uh, has all the, the skills offensively to you know, be a great fullback. He can climb the ladder and, and take the high ball. He's a dominant runner, frees his arms up to offload. So this is a first step in a huge journey for him. And there's going to be, you know, errors and blemishes, but they're going to be teaching tape and, and lessons for him. So really keen to see how it starts on Saturday. Aside from that... And can I just jump in? i just jump in there. Look, my take on that, Blaze is a natural footballer. Mm-hmm. Okay. And as you said, this has been a whirlwind transformation where uh, he's had the pre-season learning the ropes in a position that's different to the positions that he's played in in Parramatta's junior rep teams in the in the last few years. So, and he's he's got the yeah. benefit of learning under the pros pro. Quentin Gufferson oh, yeah. is, is, the, is the fullback's fullback. You know, he he yeah. is the guy that you hear Reese Walsh modelling his game on. I mean that that is the highest form of praise you can give to someone like Guffo. So Blaze has that benefit, but in saying that, you know this isn't a, a journey that he's going to accomplish across the preseason. As talented as he is, and he's going to show us incredible glimpses of talent, but it's just going to be about getting that consistency in the role, uh, making sure that he keeps the talk up defensively. Because you, as a fullback, I mean, he, he played in the halves. He understands having to organise his team, uh, but as a fullback, you just don't shut up in defence. You're just constantly barking and telling people where to go, where the numbers need to be, what the office and what the opposition is going to throw at you like what shapes you're seeing. So, yeah, we're really keen to see how it plays out. Obviously, all those positional battles that you talked about, Quint, they're big. Hayes Dunster looking to try and compete with Sean Russell on the flank. Uh, I mean, Mike Acevo's not in the team. It looks like he's, I say it looks like, it's not a surprise that he's the presumptive starter on the left wing. Uh, but Dunster needs to be able to challenge Russell here. Likewise, Harper and Simonson. One thing since uh, we'll be we're doing the preview later this week, but I want to hear from you as well, Quint. Um, in terms of the game on Saturday, who do you think starts at left centre? And should we read in anything into that? Because obviously you need someone to be playing right centre in this game, but that's Will Penasini's when it comes around one. Who gets the uh, first step, the first nod at left centre this week? I'd assume Bailey Simonson does, and that's simply because I've seen Walk and Harper play centre on both on both edges, and I've only seen Bailey play on the left side. Nothing, nothing other than that. Sixties. I think if I say something, I'm. If I speak, oh, if I speak, I'm in big trouble. Yeah, okay. yeah. We, we, we'll, we'll use the uh, the the soccer meme there. Okay, so we'll we'll leave, let him recuse himself from uh, offering an opinion there. Uh, yeah, there are there are things there are things of which I can now speak because the team list is out. But you know, I I, and, I have to leave certain things. And the other the thing for me is the vast majority of that top seventeen, uh, outside of the one and the seven. I think, and obviously the two newcomers in Harper and Talangi, um, but they're known quantities. Like, I, I know that Kai Rodwell's had a big preseason. He's going to be looking to force his way back into the, the top 17. So I, I'm hoping that's a big game. But by the same token, that extended roster, the 18 to 26, they're the players I'm really looking forward to seeing. You know, mm-hmm. um, I wouldn't be surprised if Boots, Matty Arthur gets a good run at dummy half because Brennan Hands had a great 2023. We know what he is for the Parramatta Reels. So he's going to, you know, be part of their program in the next trial which is fine. He's going to work with Joey Lussick there, so let's get Buds in there. Likewise, Mattaheli, Lynn, Guyma, Pryke, and Martin. Um, I'm hoping they all can get some, uh, not necessarily extensive, but at least healthy playing minutes. And I'll be very keen to see what they can produce. Yeah, and you know what? It's We need these games against other teams out of the preseason because I'm watching the preseason. I'm liking what I'm seeing. Uh, it's been a very different preseason. But they're playing against each other during the opposed sessions. You get that real sense of, you know, a proper game and uh, unseen opponents and it just takes on a, a whole new perspective of how are they travelling. And and as I said, I'm, you don't judge a season on pre-season games on the trials, but... You still, for the coaches, it improves their guide to how's how's player X going. 
you know, is is player Y stepped up to what we've seen in the preseason, and uh, you know they've probably all been given, I guess, their KPIs for the game, oh. things that the you know just what the coaches are looking for from them. Can they can they meet the roles that they've been asked to play in this sort of trial? So um, yeah, I looking. Just- Looking forward to it. I think in general, there is a lot for the coaching staff, for the players to get out of this trial because the Eels have taken a different approach this preseason. You know, they've, they've trained very hard, but they've also mixed it up. And how that affects their first trial is going to be interesting to get the sort of data out of. You know, will the guys be more ready? Will they be in better form? Will they be in better touch? Like, it's going to be very interesting to see how this all plays out. Um, and we'll remind you also in the in the preview trial, but you can catch this one on Fox Sports and KO. It'll be uh, both streamed and telecast on pay TV. So uh, good chance to go out there and watch it. Because um, I think the actual, if you want to go out there and watch it, I think the prices are pretty exorbitant for a trial. I think it was something like $25 or $30 to sit in the hill. And then uh, uh, maybe double that or thereabouts for the the, the uh, grandstand. So you've got different options there, but uh, make sure you get out and see this game one way or the other. Yeah, and... Also, seeing as though you've mentioned, I'll just uh, segue now into Eels training since the last podcast that we recorded. Uh, there's been uh, a camp down the south coast, as we're aware of, down at Jeringong. Uh, they didn't get back from that. That meant there wasn't a Wednesday session that I could watch last week. Friday's session, speaking of Foxtel and KO, they had Foxtel there filming training and they were filming the entire session and this is probably for like 30 seconds grab of uh, footage that they might use in those pre-season advertisements for the NRL Um, well the lead up to round one I should say rather than pre-season advertisements but you know they have that footage of teams training and uh, individuals on the training track, so it might even be far less than 30 seconds. But to grab that bit of footage, it's probably about two hours worth of filming. And I think the players and coaches do a good job of ignoring that because the cameramen are all over the field. Like, they're in amongst them while they're doing different drills. They're not far off the action when the opposed session's happening. Happening, It's interesting to watch them getting out there and film that footage. Uh, you know, probably they're probably cl- far closer to the action than what you see in an NRL game with them running the sideline. I guess that the closest thing you could compare it to would be, you know, when a, uh, a try's been scored and the cameraman or the... Or the um, the Hawkeye or whatever it's called. Is it called Hawkeye when it drops that the camera actually drops down and gets amongst them uh, from the, the wires at the top of the stadium? But uh, oh, spider, anyway. Spider it's, cam. Uh, yeah, spider cam. That's it. So it would be similar to the to that sort of uh, proximity that happens in NRL games. It, it would have been happening out there on the training track. And then Monday, well, that was – that was really the start of prep for this week against Canberra. So the NRL boys were separated. When I say the NRL boys, I mean the ones that aren't participating in the session uh, in the game this week. They were separated from the rest of the group. The two, well, they, they have got two teams worth of players there. As you see, there's 26 players named. And they went through a lot of their shapes unopposed just getting those uh, basics sorted. I don't expect to see anything special. I think they'll stick to a lot of basic shapes. They're obviously going to make sure that their defensive systems are in order. And uh, that was really the session. It was a bit of that. Um, A lot of extras, a lot of skills work that was done. I'm not sure what they've got in store for Wednesday this week, but, yeah, it's... It's starting to look more like what you get during the season, where the Monday session might be, uh, you know, a lot of skills-based work and maybe running out a few bumps and bruises leading into a Wednesday where they do a bit more football and then a, a Friday captain's run. And that's what I'm expecting them to do this week. 
Okay, fellas, that just about takes us out of uh, training. Now, junior reps results. John, can you talk us through those from last week? Yeah, a quartet of games against the Cronulla Sharks at a points bet stadium. Eels coming away with three wins from the four starts, so very good team effort across the park. Uh, the lone losers, unfortunately, in the Tasha Gale, who went down to a good crow outfit, uh, I believe it was 22-6. to six. Lisa Fiola triumphed 12-4, to four, and that was the curtain raise of the opening game there in the quartet of games. It was a double to Leonia, Leonia, Leonia sorry, Vey uh, in the 17-56 minute. Uh, they got the Eels across the line. Bowie Ma Chong tacked on the two conversions there, so the 12-4 to four victory. Gets the Eels on the board after a tough, tough loss to the Bulldogs in round one, so that's good to see. Uh, we mentioned earlier that the Eels dropped the game in the Tash Gale. They went down 22-6. to six. Kalisa Mahe, the lone scorer in the 53rd minute for the Eels. Bella Sanford did convert that try. NRLW player Lindsay Tilly actually spent some time in the Sinbin in this 160s. Now, this is a game that they're probably going to look back and sort of rue that they lost it. You were mentioning to me that there was a big turning point uh, at one point in the game where the Eels sort of had bo- uh, botched a try, led to a seven-tackle set, that then saw the Cronulla Sharks go down and score. Uh, so that one flipped the script and probably a lot of the momentum in that game. So unfortunately, the uh, Tachigal moved to 0-2 in the season. They need to pick up uh, their game very quickly if they're going to make a run for the finals. Harold Matthews, they've probably been the pick of the four junior rep programs thus far across two rounds. Too good for the Sharks, 34-20. to They actually raced out to a big lead. I think it was 18-0 or 16-0. Um, I think it was 18-0. No, 18-4, to sorry. Uh, before the Sharks put together a good comeback to end up taking the lead. Eels came home too strong, though. Lincoln Fletcher bagging a double. Mason Ong, Samuel Polly, Nathan Howitt and Cyrus Bloomfield also scoring. Fletcher, five from six from the tee. He's been very sharp in, in his role as a goal kicker there. So Eels, too good for the Sharks. I think they might move, if I just quickly check the ladder, I think that might give them a share. They're not outright leaders. Eight points and points differential behind the Panthers, but uh, one of only two teams alongside Penrith to win their first two games, it looks like. Uh, no. I oh, know because that's a buy. Uh, the Bulldogs, the only other team to win their two uh, first two fixtures. So you've got three teams of a buy and a win to their, no, more than three teams of a buy and a win to their name, it looks like. But uh, the only two, only three teams to win uh, Penrith, Parramatta, and Canterbury. So I got there. And then in the SG Ball, they found a way to win in spite of themselves for the second week running. Their 28 18 victory of the Sharks uh, gives them obviously a share of top spot in the ladder. Uh, Lorenzo Talatina, Dominic Ferrugia, Tyrese Lucchini, Dylan Brettel, and Jai Camilleri scoring. Dom Ferrugia going four from five off the tee. Uh, like Fletcher in the grade below, very, very good in terms of his conversion rates for the first two rounds of the season. Uh, so, yeah, good to see the boys getting the job done here. Probably be nice for their blood pressure and their coach's blood pressure to get it done a little bit earlier in the game. But uh, finding a way to win is much better than finding a way to lose. So, well done to the SG Ball. And um, they've, they've honestly been quite you know, solid across the first two rounds considering who's not available. And we mentioned quite a few of the players in that NRL team list. Uh, so, yeah, good to see them banking the wins early in the season because, um, as our Tasha Gale girls might find out, when you drop those first few games, it can put you in a hole. Whereas with the SG Ball, winning these games, even if it isn't pretty, uh, helps you a long, 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 uh, long, long way when it comes to the back end of the season and you're jostling for not necessarily even a spot in the back end of the, the pack, but... Uh, you know, a top four berth or top two berth, depending on what the format is this year. We haven't gotten clarity on that yet. So well done to the ball for making that win. Yeah, and the ball are the only match that will be yes. played this week in junior reps. Correct. They're, they're out at Eric Tweedale Stadium on Saturday, and I, I believe we've got a flag and a New South Wales Cup trial, I think, as well, uh, out at Eric Tweedale Stadium on Saturday. Uh, I should mentioned that uh, well, I wanted to discuss the goal kicking mate because um, just as you were r- running through that the in the in the Harold Mats the sharks didn't quite overhaul the eels they pulled back to being level in tries but uh, the eels superior goal kicking of Lincoln Fletcher still kept the eels four points ahead when the sharks had tied things up at four tries apiece yeah and it, and it was from there that uh, the Eels uh, kicked away. And, uh, Cronulla, put two, the... from, two from four in the Harold Matthews and one from four in the SG Ball. That's a lot of scoreboard pressure you're missing out on, isn't it? And the fact yeah. that Fletcher and Ferruja are doing such a good job. And the thing is that the, obviously any almost anyone can knock it over from close to the post, but these guys are hitting them from out wide consistently. Uh, so yes. they've, they've been huge assets to their team in that regard. 
Uh, and yeah, the ability to go up in batches of six instead of four at, at any grade, NRL, New South Wales Cup, junior, uh, junior representatives, it, it is an incredible advantage to have. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, um, you know, there's there's been plenty to like about the Harold Matthews team. Uh, you, you've, you've done quite a good job talking about that there. What I like about the SG ball team is there's obviously a lot of character in that team because mm-hmm. for two weeks in a row, they've been behind on the scoreboard deep into the second half and managed to rally and come home strongly to uh, kick away from the other team. And, you know, the Sharks, mate, they're, they're not chump change. Never in, the, never in the junior reps. In, yeah. in junior reps. So they are two terrific wins for uh, the, the mats and the ball in getting that. The return to the winners list of the Lisa Fiola Cup does not surprise me. They were a very strong group of girls last year, and I know some of them have moved up to Tasha Gale Cup as well this year. But they look; it was a it was a really tight game against the Sharks. But I think there was a there was a lot of I think there was a lot more correct decisions that the players made this week. I think they stuck to their systems quite well, especially in defence. The Tasha Gale, as I said to you, mate, that that first 15 or so minutes, I thought that Parramatta were the the strongest team out on the field. But then, yeah, that that missed try. um, So it was a disallowed try to Caitlin Peden. And the Sharks were given a seven-tackle set, obviously, for the... It was uh, it was ruled, I think, that she lost the ball over the line. Um, Maybe a tough call. I'm not too sure. There, it was a bit hard to see um, what happened with the ball there. But uh, the refs ruled it a, a lost ball over the line. Uh, seven tackle restart. The Sharks do the length of, go the length of the field and score, and then they go added another two tries before halftime. The whole momentum change then. And then you mentioned the sin binning of Lindsay Tui, which happened early in the second half. The Sharks added two tries while she was mm-hmm. off the field. So there you go. I mean, that was literally the match. But I did want to mention the last try that the Eels put on because it's it's worth giving a, a mention to it because I'm hoping it's the impetus to turn things around and say to the girls, look, this is what's possible because I was really, I really thought that their second phase play was was very strong in that game. Uh, occasionally, they pick the wrong time to offload, and that tends to be where you start to see some incomplete sets. But the skill set looks really good, and the last try, which was scored by Parramatta, you had uh, Khaleesi Mahe. She's taken the ball in a, a right side, um, short short side play. She's put um, Lindsay Tui off into space. Then she's backed up on the inside, the prop, and taken the taken the ball and sprinted away to score uh, between the posts. It was look. It was a it was a really encouraging try to see, and I'm hoping, as I said, that it's the it's the impetus for them to to work towards a win. Now themselves, the the Tasha Gar, the Lisa Fia Ola Cup, and Harold Matz, they don't play for two weeks, and that will be round four against the Steelers down in Wollongong. So, mate, the girls have had a tough start to the year. They're away at Belmore, yeah, away away at, at, down at the Sharks, yep. and, away and then away at down at Wollongong. Yep, it's That's uh... a those sort of things can really, as we spoke about for the NRL season for the Eels last year, they can really shape and define your season early on, can't they? When you get a tough draw of tough travelling and some bad luck, um, you find yourself in an 0-2, 0-3 hole, uh, as we saw off the NRL, it was 0-3 before they managed to get the Golden Point victory against the Panthers. And yeah, that, that catches up with you real quick when it comes to the business end of the season. So hopefully they can pick it up after the bye. Um, and, and sort of use that to, like you said, use that momentum from the end of the Cronulla Sharks game to shape what comes ahead for them. But 
yeah, some tough luck with the draw for sure for the ladies. Yep. Okay, moving on with the news, Clint, we've had uh, Mahalia Murphy extending with the club. That's got to be good news for the NRLW team. Well, she was a real shining light in what was otherwise a disappointing season in the NRLW last year following the uh, the grand final appearance from the season before. And, you know, um, if she, she's a very well-liked character around the club. On top of that, you know, we, we saw her uh, SAS appearance where she went uh, deep into, uh, geez, do you call it a competition, a game show? Uh, you know, it, it, it's a hybrid of both, right? So, um, you know, she, she's clearly someone who... Um, has the pedigree and 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 uh, I I guess the character is the word I'm looking for um, that you want around the club. She's certainly um, someone who I believe can uh, form part of the leadership group in the NRLW era as well. You know, we, we've obviously got the likes of Rachel Pearson, Kennedy Sherrington, Elsie Albert. You know, I, I see her as a part of that that core group and to um, also help nurture some of the the young talent that we have coming through the grades as well. Yeah, and there. I think that leadership shone through in that uh, SAS reality show and that's what those celebrities, uh, and we use, I guess we use that in inverted commas for the definition of celebrities, uh, <laughs> but, but those those sports stars, the TV and uh, media stars, they're putting themselves into situations that the average person doesn't want to do. <laughs> and and I thought she really shone in that and, as you said, really showed leadership characteristics. So I think that's a, a, it's a tremendous pickup for the Eels. I know, Forty, you've been a big fan of Mahalia oh, as well that season. Tough, physical, explosive, ticks a lot of boxes that you like in any player, but let alone a forward and an edge prospect. So... Very glad to have her back on board for a couple of seasons, and yeah, it gives you another building stone, a bit like you know, building block to shape the the NRLW's future under a new coach in Steve George Owls. So I imagine he's going to enjoy coaching her and looking to get the best out of her. Yeah, and speaking of NRLW forty, they make up the bulk of Parramatta mm-hmm. representation in the All Stars fixtures. Yes, indeed, six reps for the Eels across the two games. In the uh, NRL All Stars, Jermaine Hopgood, the lone rep for the men, he'll be playing for the Indigenous All Stars. You got to imagine he's starting in this game. Have, they haven't announced the teams proper yet. I don't think they just announced the squads. But yeah, good to see Hoppy getting rewarded for his breakout year in 2023. And then for the women, uh, NRLW co-captain Kennedy Charrington will make her third consecutive appearance for the Maori All Stars. Uh, she's going to be lining up alongside uh, Parramatta Eels winger Zali Fay. And then you've got three Eels in the Indigenous team, including Mahali, who we just spoke about. He'll be playing alongside Monique Donovan, uh, who's a winger, and uh, Tanika Todhunter, who we saw last year, who plays dummy half utility. So it's going to be fun to watch those two games play out. As always, you hope for no injuries. Um, that's always a big concern of any game, but especially uh, what is essentially an exhibition game. Um, but yeah, looking forward to seeing them rep for both the Eels and for their heritage. Yes, and we round out Eels News with their season launch that took place Thursday last week. Fellas, unfortunately... No invitation. Our... <laughs> Still in the mail. Yeah, it, it, was lost, it was lost in the mail. That's Bloody the, the post, Australia Post. Australia Post, mate, come on. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, oh, look, I had the suit all ready to go. Clint, I, I know that you'd got a haircut, especially for... The event, uh, John, you had that special tie picked out. Yep, yep. It, you know, it's it's disappointing, but yeah, the unfortunately the mail, you know, these things happen, I guess. So we weren't able to be there, listeners. Can, can we call the postmaster general and and, and get to the bottom of what happened there? <laughs> yeah, look, there I, needs to be an I, investigation. I, I, yeah, I was <laughs> I was about to do my Jeff put uh, two V impersonation there, mate, but you. Beat me to it. Yes, there does have to be an investigation. We can't report on what was happening there. All we can suggest is head to the Eels official site. There's photos up there. I think there's 100 plus photos from the event. So you'll be able to get an idea about what took place. But we did see photos of the NRL top 30. Yeah, and there were Will, Will Penasini had a chat to the Channel 9 reporter as well. 
um, you know, just talking about his personal expectations for uh, season 2024 as well as the teams. They also got the classic, are you going to play rugby union question in there, <laughs> so, um, which he handled expertly, I must say. Um, but yeah, I didn't realise Will had grown his hair a little bit. So that was... Uh, yes, he has. Yeah, he good, has. Good to see. It's, uh, it's sometimes when you see uh, players have a bit of a different look, you have to, you have to think, who's that? Yeah, when you see it from a distance. But um, it was the same when Morgan Harper arrived. Yes, and with, he got in the haircut. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yep. The, the opposite. Yep. Yeah, so um, anyway, uh, they had the big launch. Now, for supporters, the Open Fan Day is going to be this Sunday. Now, it kicks off at 9.30, goes through to 12.30. It's in Parramatta Square in Parramatta. And, of course, it gives you that opportunity to uh, grab some autographs and selfies with the players. There's stuff there for the kids. It's meant as a family-friendly day. So I guess get down there, get amongst it, start to warm up for the season proper and say g'day to your favourite Eels players. So that's that's all ahead this week. So, uh, mate, that brings us to the most anticipated part of the podcast. <laughs> it's that time where people have, they've just ducked off right now. They're ducking off now as I'm rambling. They're, they're going to the loo. They're grabbing a drink. Um, there may be um, those smokers might be out there having a, having a quick cigarette break. Who knows? But they're taking their break at the halfway point of our podcast. They're coming back in and you're about to hit them with this week's music what do you got for us yeah last week got me uh a little bit mixed up you know sort of woke up something in me and i got all jazzed up so <laughs> i went i went looking down that path and i love a bit of jazz but what's better than jazz a bit of fusion jazz so uh, this week we're going with a bit of hip-hop jazz um so we'll see what it takes us John, should I be raising the roof as that's playing? Should that be the should that move that I'm putting on? <laughs> exactly. Um, that that uh, little bit of jazz maestro comes from a YouTube channel called Ollie Parker, O-L-I Parker. He's got some fun stuff on there. So, yeah, uh, I always enjoy the different interpretations and the uh, reimagining of stuff uh, from its original format. You know, obviously the most basic level of that is from electric to acoustic or vice versa, and you see some great uh, covers that way. But when something's rearranged in a you know jazz format or a classical format, when it's a rock song or a rap song, it's always interesting to see how what the uh, end product is. So hope you enjoyed that one. Yeah, and uh, for those people that did duck out to uh, grab a cigarette as their break, don't smoke. <laughs> just, I mean, that, that, that's, that's just, the truth, isn't it? Yeah. And kids stay in school. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Healthy reminders for our listeners There's out there. Plenty of other voices no you can out have. With Matt Burton. Stay away from Matt Burton. Oh, God. <laughs> yes. The, the earth is a sphere. It is not flat. Uh, now, just uh, just before we finish that music, mate, I, I had images, and I'm not a big Star Wars fan, I have to admit it, but is that the sort of music that would be expected to be played in a yeah. bar somewhere? Cantina, in a Star Wars cantina band. Yeah, yeah, are you thinking of cantina yeah, band? Yeah, that that is. Uh, it does sort of delve into cantina territory there with the the trumpet. So, yeah, and that that is. Uh, there's some really fun stuff with the Star Wars cantina music that you can find. Of you're talking about rearrangements and whatnot. Um, yeah, it's another one that might end up popping up on the podcast at some point. So when I was younger, I used to play the Ewok theme when we first got our dog, and I just used to <laughs> I used to follow him around with the Ewok because he looked like a little Ewok. Uh, <laughs> this is a little <laughs> segue for the Star Wars fans that are listening. Well, how about another segue 
as we go into NRL news because there's maybe a couple of Broncos players that spent too long in a cantina somewhere on <laughs> the weekend. No, they just... <laughs> yeah, you oh, were... but... Remember the, the South Park? They're just getting in Some the mood for fans. getting in the mood for round zero. Remember the South Park episode of Russell Crowe fighting around the world? <laughs> they're just getting you know, Russ, Russ is out there doing promos for the NRL. They're just you know, fighting around, yeah, the, world. Fighting around the world. Yeah, so they're just getting into the the mood of what Rusty laid down on South Park. Now, honestly, <laughs> fellas, is this uh, mountain out of a molehill territory with what's been made from it? Uh, obviously, there are some serious issues to face as a result of it. The timing is abysmal. <laughs> um, the the brains... Not for us, it's hilarious for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously their brains have gone right out the window, but yep. there's no... Like, in terms of internal issues at the Broncos, it's a nothing, isn't it? Well... Yeah, you'd think so. I look at it this way. The fact that there is tension in an NRL squad and some guys get into a bit of a, not even a brawl, but like, you know, they arc up at each other and whatnot, that's not a shock. You know, not every, nah. when, you're, when you're talking about a top 30 that are also supplemented by four to six development players plus all your second tier players that are part of the enlarged first grade squad, not everyone's going to be good mates. I suppose the issue for the Broncos is that this isn't, you know, a winger and a prop or a winger and a depth guy. This is your halfback, your lock forward, your two leaders, and they're they're clearly not maybe they're not feuding, but they're also not getting along that well. So I, I don't think it's storm I think it's more than storm in a teacup, but I don't think it's also the mountain that some might, people might try trying to make out of that molehill. But yeah, they're it's probably one to watch. Um, you know, the the fact that it's the two senior players is what gets me. You don't often see that in the NRL. Like you, you see guys beefing on and arcing up, but you don't usually see your, your captain or your two co-captains uh, doing this. Mm. Uh, do, Clint, do you put do you put the blame on one player or the other or both? Where, where do you see? Uh, this? Well, uh, firstly, I don't I don't personally see it as a massive issue in 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 isolation. Um, I do see it as an issue because these are supposedly two leaders of this club and they should know better, mm. particularly on the eve of, of round zero. And when they're going to be flying internationally to a country that is notorious, notorious for being hard to get into um, in, in terms of visa <laughs> approval. Yep. Um, you know, it, like, like they're, they're, um, they're very particular about criminal records before um, uh, rubber stamping someone into the U.S., um, via plane. So, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of um, uh, EQ that's exited the building in, on, in this front. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say that I'm surprised um, per se, because, you know, to, to kind of echo what Forty was getting at there, you know, it, it, it's not uncommon for um, these types of, uh, I guess, relationships or lack thereof to exist within NRL squads. There's a lot of testosterone that's flying mm -hmm. around the um, the field every single day, and it's natural that uh, that that people will come to blows at at some point because that's the nature of competition. Um, what's more concerning is that it's happened in this social setting yep. from two Agreed. leaders who should know better at, at this particular yeah. point in time of the season when they're getting geared to go fly overseas to kick off their um to kick off, to kick off their season. on the training paddock where someone lays out a big hit and then you know tempers fray. Understandable that happens. Yeah. Like you said, the te that's testosterone, that's adrenaline pumping, and you know, guys looking to get up and, and you know, sort of stand up for themselves off the field in a social setting. That's a concern. And for the Broncos, mm. look, it, they they choked away a grand final win, and now they're, they're, they're not going to have the target on their back being the premiers, they're going to have the target on their back to show that they can do it again. And when you start mm. fracturing at the cell, fraying at the seams, and fracturing apart off the field like that, it's going to make it that much easier for both the media and opposition teams to start digging in. With the claws, so yeah. and and social media has 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 spread this like wildfire. Oh, that it, yeah. it, it, it's come under scrutiny. You know, in years gone by, they would have been protected by the Brisbane media up there. But you know, the the, the rest of the NRO media is a lot less forgiving, and you know, yeah. and that's where that scrutiny will come from. Yes, indeed. yeah. And I, I had a wise man talking to me today about if that had happened uh, back in the late 90s with Alfie Langer, who may not have been out of the realms of his character to have a bit of a wrestle with 
another player <laughs> or two and that for a start the media would have been taking a completely different approach to it it would have been probably laughing and praising mm. Alfie for you know the, the little bloke, a little bloke's holding his own against the against the big forward and you know it's all a bit of hijinks and a bit of a laugh and obviously in the years since then Alfie shared some anecdotes about his <laughs> escapades <laughs> with within the Broncos setup and his, it, during his time as a player some of the hijinks they'd get up to and now you can't get up to hijinks so my question with the Broncos and to the Broncos players is why did you think it was a good idea to get on the Terps that much in the, mm. it, you know, when you're just about to go over to Las Vegas, when you're just about to start the season, not talking about ending the season, at the start of the season that you get on the Terps that much, that you get thrown out of a, an establishment, and the, the, the pile on, the, the mucking around, the bit of a wrestle, that, that's gonna, that can happen with any mm. group of mates that are, that have had a bit to drink, but again, it comes back to, and so I don't think that's an issue in terms of, you know, Broncos players having an issue with each other. I think no. it's just, a, it's a product of doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. And getting, that's that leadership issue, right? That's, that's right. <laughs> you know, like and, these, these two guys that you go, like they should have, at what point did they go, you know what, we should call it here. We need to stop. Yep. You know, like that, that, that they, if they wanted to go have a quiet drink together or whatever, you know, we've won and done. Yep. And I think just taking what Forty said in terms of watch what happens from here, I reckon if there was no media focus on it, those two blokes are fine with each other. Mm. But the it's media true. focus now where they're having to front the media, they're having to explain themselves to the board of directors, the owners of the club, the coach, etc. Whoever's the guilty party, the other one, you know, the most guilty, the other one's likely to maybe be a bit peeved and right, maybe rightly so, that it escalated to the point where it's embarrassing for them. And uh, that is possibly the thing. Can that person who maybe feels aggrieved be able to move past it this year? Uh, as I said, without the media attention, I reckon it's a it's a complete zero for anything between the two of them. Um, I still think it I still think it won't amount to much. But human nature is interesting, and when they're in the spotlight like this, I think someone's going to be a little pissed off. That's just my take on it, um, fellas. We've already had the first of the footy of the preseason. <laughs> Manly the <laughs> Manly Reserves. <laughs> Manly Reserves hammered South Reserves in an early trial. Do you take anything from that other than they're going to have a stronger reserve grade than the South Sydney club? Second standing Never. elevation Luke Brooks has gotten for a trial game. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, good on the, the the New South Wales Cup players for for getting some uh, runs in their legs, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So we did see. Obviously, that uh, Manly were far stronger in the halves with having first grade experience in Jake Arthur and Luke Brooks. Uh, I've already seen the the puns coming in that there'll be Brooksvale signs <laughs> in Manly games this year. I guess that's to be expected. That's yeah, that, that, Luke that, Brooks. That to, to be honest, you'd be disappointed if that wasn't being done. Yeah. Now I'll be disappointed if they can't do better. Yeah, pretty much. You, 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 that, 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 that's a minimum effort now, isn't it? It absolutely is. So Luke Brooks unleashed uh, unironically? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there anything really we want to discuss out of that? Nah. I think it's... Yeah. I think it's... No. Uh, the, it's a, honestly, those sort of results are just a waste of time. Like, for everyone involved, like, it, it is not even a training run. Like, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's let's jump into something that you've already touched on, 40. The Gladiator explains the rules of rugby league to the American public. Now I'm gonna I want to I want to jump to Clint first because uh, Clint's done a bit of bit of travelling over in America in recent years. Mm. Uh, you you've been to an NFL game? I think I've from, been to a, I've been to a few. Yeah, 
Yeah. So, mate, how do you think the American public that are interested in rugby league will respond to this? Because our good mate, uh, Ron, he's he's been banging on about the American public do not understand the difference between rugby league and rugby union. Mm. Keep calling it rugby. And I think one of the things out of this video is that the uh, the script calls for Russell Crowe to use the term rugby league numerous times. Mm. In. So, yeah, what, what's, what's your take, first of all, before I go to John for his... Well, I watched the video earlier this afternoon. I thought I thought overall it was a pretty good job, but you know, the um, maybe maybe my only real criticism of it is that it, it is a five minute long video, yeah. and we know the attention span That's of the ter- average person terrible, isn't too long these terrible days. Terrible for engagement metrics. Yeah, yeah, you know, so you got you got to be wanting to watch the video in the first instance. But you know, you immediately identify that it's it's Russell when uh, the, the second you hear it. I thought he you know, and, and and he's got a very distinctive and. Um, and engaging voice himself, if you ask me. But a, a five-minute video is a long video. You know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have minded if they, you know, and, and it might still be part of their um, their promotional plan with it. But if they they broke up the rules into little into little um, bite sizes, so that it can be easily consumed within you know um, 20, 30 seconds, so, sort think, of like a I YouTube think, short. Yeah, I think the the way that it's been put together, I think it lends itself to that. Yeah, and and you'd imagine it, it, you know, someone would do that. You know, it, it, someone someone in the NRL marketing team wouldn't be doing their due diligence if they didn't do that. But you know, um, uh, overall, I think it's um, I, I feel like it was a good start. And it, um, but that being said, you know, it, it just it, it, uh, we should have probably leaned a little bit more into the entertainment value of it. And I would have preferred that they used a little bit more of the American football lexicon in there. It, they kind of sprinkled it in there at different points. I think the script should have looked to make a lot more direct translations. Um, so to, to make it a little bit more relatable, because there's there's points where, you know, like they're talking about a try and 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 then make the obvious comparison to a touchdown. But I thought there was a couple more areas where they could have really um really connected those dots for the uh, for the American public to make it um I I guess uh, that comparison um, a lot more real life for them. I... Yeah. Now, I was going to say we have to get John's takes on this as well because you are a, a, an aficionado of American sport, John. You you love uh, sport all all around the world, but American sport is also one of your passions. Um, shout the out Seattle Seahawks. Yes, big big um, coach to the Seahawks. Actually, uh, I've got to give a shout out at this stage to Graham from. Uh, the Parramatta Reels uh, junior rep staff who this last, uh, well, this week was over watching the Super Bowl in Las Vegas when uh, spoke to him at the previous round at Eric Tweedale Stadium and he was really looking forward to the trip being able to see the Super Bowl live. He was a uh, San Francisco supporter, so going to come away a little bit. Very harsh way to go down. Yeah, a little bit disappointed. My heart bleeds for him, poor 49ers fan. Oh. (laughs) And look, look, we might might get to a couple of your takes on the uh, Super Bowl before we finish the podcast, Audi. But, yeah, what's your take on the uh, Gladiator run? Rose. It's a fundamentally sound and safe advertising program. Um, I do have a significant beef with it, and it's not to do with appealing to the American audience. Um, obviously, they're doing. If you watch the footage, uh, in terms of all the positive plays, it's glamorizing the four teams that are taking part <laughs> in the actual Ground Zero contest. But guess which team features on every other clip in terms yeah, of making I, a mistake? I saw that too. I saw that too, John. Yeah, they. they I didn't want to say it. They uh, certainly went to the uh, the cabinet yeah. for the Parramatta Reels there and, and found the footage of uh, us doing all the things wrong. So that was always fun. Um, yeah, yeah, the forward pass. Thanks for yeah, that. Thanks for that. And then, you know, we got Woody getting laid out against Manly. Um, there's a couple other errors there for the Parramatta Reels. I think the, Some of the those Darwin, Broncos the Darwin game. Yep, yep exactly. Picks. Yep. So thank you, NRL. Thank you, Rusty, for uh, bringing... I suppose that might, that might go back to the Book of Feuds, honestly. Rusty's upset that we uh, finally got the wood over him last year. So, no. Nah. 
Uh, it's it's a it's a solid campaign. It's safe. It, it doesn't do anything incredible. It doesn't really challenge for um, mm. the viral nature of what you need to do in the modern advertising zeitgeist. Um, I, I go back to what we were talking about when we did our um, sort of um, Round Zero Think Tank podcast. And yeah, the, none of this, like obviously you can break it up, but it, this isn't built for TikTok. This isn't built for Instagram. This isn't built for the social media generation. Um, and mm. I feel like they could have really leaned into the Aussie identity, um, you know, and, and also the American tropes of the Aussie identity, you know, shrimp on the Barbie, drinking a Foster's and have, you know, players barbecuing and having a conversation cut into, you know, the, whatever the clip they want to explain in a 20 second stinger, you know, whether it's, you know, the big mm. hit or whatnot. And maybe, you know, maybe it's missed opportunity, but Russell Crowe's obviously, he's still a, a certified A-lister um, and that obviously is going to help the game, but yeah, they, they played it very safe with this. And well, so you can't be upset, but you also feel like if they were serious about going into America and they really wanted to make some big inroads and, and take a risk, because that's what it is. You, you have to take a risk. You can't play it mm-hmm. safe and crack the market. I think maybe they missed the trick here. Yeah, well, we have to, we would have to hope and think that there's going to be a bit more in the way of promo videos rather than just here's the rules of the game. Oh, mm. I, I'd like to think that this rules of the game uh, it is directed for those to those who want to understand the game, that want to go to the game and understand the fundamentals of what they are about to watch. And we know that our field supporters that are going to be there are, you know, they're reasonably familiar with all the rugby league rules. You'd have to say that the American supporters, no matter who they are, that are have become fans of rugby league, they know what they're going to get. They're going for the experience of now seeing a game they've fallen in love with live. So it's mm. those that are going out of a curiosity factor that don't know too much about it, that have seen the promotions. Maybe they've got friends who are Australians or friends that have told them about rugby league. Maybe they're just sports nuts and want to go to the game. Uh, they need that push um, to get them um, excited as well as informing them about the, the basics of the game. And maybe mm-hmm. maybe that basics is being t- directed to them. Um, I guess we're not over there seeing some of the promotion. So we're, I mean, we're, we're assuming that there hasn't been too much yet because we haven't really well, seen too much, have we? Well- what, what, what I'd really like to see is them, you know, leverage some of the goodwill that's ex- um, already existing within the marketplace. I mean, we, we only spoke a couple of weeks ago about Billy Otto Masilla's um, try for the Maryland's Rams. They got over 135 million views across online platforms. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's stuff existing there already. Lean into it. It's mm-hmm. already it, it's already there for you. You know, and, 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 and that highlight itself, you know, like that, that, that's showing the entertainment value of our brilliant sport. You know, I, you, you should be um, mirroring that over with some of the, um, with the NRL footage of players running in a similar, in similar format, you know, in, in, in similar style. Um, you know, I, I, I think there's opportunities there, um, you know, if, if, if they look hard enough. And there's plenty of um, footage on, on YouTube as well of, an American watches an NRL game for the first time and an American watches this NRL player's highlights and rates them, you know, like start, start knocking on, on, on the inboxes of some of these people who are already engaged with this content, get that, get them doing some self promotion for you as well. I mean, yeah. if you're talking about you know, impressions and whatnot, there's a YouTuber called John boy, who's already doing cricket and some other Australian sports. Who's big in the baseball scene. He also does like, he does uh, lip reading stuff. Like engage the influ- influences, like you know, get your mm-hmm. fo- your foot in the door there, um, you know, get them on the ground doing content for you. But yeah, I, I think that the, the ship has sailed on that because obviously Ground Zero is just around the corner now. Um, but if they're going to make this a, a legitimate push across the next couple of years, because obviously they've flagged their intention to go back uh, next year and beyond, I, I think they do need to be brasher. They need to take some yeah. risks. Like you, you can't just play it safe and expect to actually get a foothold in the American market. Yeah, I agree. Um, John, very quickly, did you enjoy the Super Bowl? Um, it was actually a pretty dour game, honestly. Um, this mm-hmm. was this is also like a, as a supporter, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Outcome for me, um, the Chiefs are uh, the 
sort of like presumptive dynasty of the modern era now since Tom Brady's hung up the boots. They've done a great job stepping in for what the Patriots had with both Brady and Belichick. Um, Mahomes and Reid have been a fantastic QB coach duo. And yeah, they won their, their third uh, Super Bowl on the back of that. Um, but yeah, it, it was a very rough first half. I think the, the defense of both teams did a great job stifling uh, the dynamic offenses, um, which was a bit of a surprise because uh, the 49ers have a schematic genius a coach uh, in Shanahan and obviously Mahomes is just an absolute prodigy at QB. So to see both of them not execute in the way you would have imagined. And the 49ers moved the ball, but they couldn't convert the points, which was a big surprise. Uh, but then the second half opened the game up a bit more. There was some drama on the sideline with a player confronting his coach. There was a shot of Taylor Swift every other minute. Um, seeing her reaction. To Annoyingly it. so. Yep. Yeah, so, you know, got to got to get the uh, impressions there, though, for the young audience that they want to try and capture amongst all the Swifties. Um, no, yeah. I was going to say, um, can I interject and, and sh- send out an apologies to any Swifties that are listening right now? John doesn't really mean it. He doesn't really mean it. He's a, he's a mean and nasty. Hey. Person. Are you sixties? Are you suggesting that they should shake it off? I just shake it off. That's, maybe, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, look, <laughs> t- Taylor makes some very, very catchy songs. I've got to say that she is like, un- like pure, understilled pop. Um, she's very good at that. But yeah, second half open up the game. Um, I do have to have a caveat. As a Seahawks fan, the 49ers are a divisional rival, so seeing them lose, <laughs> it's kind of like watching Manly butcher a grand final. So that's always good to see. Um, so it was probably the, the, it was probably the better of the two results, seeing a dynasty being consolidated versus seeing the 49ers break the drought from the nineties or wherever it is when they won won their last ring. Um, and and this isn't this is the second time in about three or four years that they've lost. They've, to they've been the, the best. Yeah, the they've, they've been the best team not to win a, a win a ring for the last decade, pretty much. Yeah, um, and they've actually got parallels to the ninety oh, was it ninety two to ninety four ninety five. The Buffalo team that went to four straight Super Bowls and never won one. Um, they didn't. They haven't gone oh, four straight, but they've, they've, they've been of that caliber. They've been an incredible team. Got a great head coach who is on the cutting edge of the, the schematic side of things when it comes to the offense and a lot of great, talented players, but haven't been able to – they've essentially butchered the big games. And the, the, the talking point of this one was Mahomes engineers the comeback, uh, brings them to extra time, which in the past, the American extra time system is a bit weird. Uh, for the longest time it was both teams will get a chance to possess the ball unless the first team that possesses the ball scores a touchdown. If you kick a field goal, you're going to get you get a right of reply as the other team to uh, try and answer. But if they scored a touchdown, it was over. That is incredibly biased to the team that won the coin toss and got to go first. So they changed it this year. So even if a touchdown was scored, the right of reply would go to the other team to match it. And then you play on from there, win or lose, or go to extra, uh, extra, extra time. Uh, the 49ers apparently didn't realise this. The coaches and the players came out after the game saying they didn't realise the rules had changed. They chose to go first. Uh, there is actually a second, like a, uh, there is a prime move. In the context now of the new rules, there's a prime move at disadvantage because if you defend, you can then know how to best handle your offensive reply where you need to kick a field goal, score a touchdown and whatnot. And the Chiefs had a game plan for extra time where uh, if they were down a touchdown, which they weren't, they went down a field goal. But if they were to score a touchdown, they're always going to go for two instead of kicking the extra point to tie the game up because then the next points would win the game, which means that the 49ers get the ball back and a field goal wins. So they were never going to play for extra, extra time. So they were much better equipped for the extra time. And the, the most hilarious part of it all was the Chiefs, to win it, ran a play that, won in their, uh, ran a play that they'd run in their previous two Super Bowl wins that score a touchdown. <laughs> so they've literally put it on in tape. In the last three seconds. Put, put, put it on tape, yes, in the last three seconds of the, of the extra time quarter. They've put it on tape in two previous Super Bowls and uh, none of the, the two teams after the first instance had studied up on it. So it is crazy. Like that in the NFL where everything's put on a microscope, the fact that they're able to get away with it for a third time is like comical. So well done to Kansas City. Um, and yeah, it ended up being entertaining in the context of the extra time, but it wasn't a Super Bowl for the ages. Well, John, I can freely admit that I what I tuned in for the last six and a half minutes of the game, uh, which is the first minutes of NFL that I'd watched <laughs> for this particular season. Maybe <laughs> first minutes I'd watched for multiple seasons, and so I tuned in. I think it was about ten to three when there yep, was yep. about six and a half minutes to go. Um, that six and a half minutes extended, I think, to it, nearly it was the longest quarter past three, long, longest ever Super Bowl. <laughs> they they milked it for ads and and stoppages. 
massively this year was bad. John, they 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 when they stopped for the two minute warning, I think they must have put in three or four minutes of ads. Yeah, the, two the, there is there are, because- there are TV timeouts. So there are, there are stoppages in play brought about by the actual gameplay itself, whether the ball is dead or there's a timeout court. There are also TV timeouts. So there's yeah. like legitimately time given for advertising, um, which is obviously a, a, the wet dream of any sort of you know corporate management. But in the case of the, mm-hmm. in the case of the Super Bowl, we all know about Super Bowl ads, but it was too much this year. The, and the, oh. even even disregarding the extra time, which is just a function of the game itself, it was a long Super Bowl. And well, fact, that last two minutes, mate. That last two minutes, I think, went for twelve minutes. Oh, the the final two minutes in baseball, no baseball, in basketball. Sorry, basketball, basketball, and NFL. Uh, the the last two minutes can go for half an hour. It is actually crazy. Mm. Oh, see, that's that's not sport that I enjoy watching. I and I hate to be, you know, throwing in a negative about a sport that absolutely hundreds of millions of people enjoy, but that's. Unfortunately, that's not something for me. It's, so that, it's, that's fair it's not a great viewing experience no. on TV. But when you're in the arena, or in the case of basketball, or at the ground, in the case of football, there um, the the fan engagement and the um, and the intra entertainment that actually happens there makes it go by very quickly for you. You wouldn't think so because I have the same frustrations watching it on telecast. But you, you when you're actually at the ground. Um, you know, the, 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 that's why the, I guess the US sport gets a lot of uh, kudos for um, their fan engagement. It's because the way that the sport's set up, it lends itself that you need to have it <laughs> in order to be um, a competitive entertainment option. And to be fair, in the regular season, a lot of those issues aren't as uh, extrapolated, aren't as magnified. No. Um, like you still get TV timeouts and whatnot, but when there's a team in a close game, it's usually one team trying to play tempo and run the clock down. Um, or try and make the clock stretch as far, like get as much as they can out of the clock. So there's a lot more action in the final two minutes. But in the case of this game, when you're trying to you know jam as many adver- adverts down the massive viewership as you can, uh, on top of the fact that it was a Dow game, it yeah it makes for a very ordinary product. Oh, mm. but, but I guess what you were talking about with a fan engagement and uh, being there at the venue. Perhaps rugby league's got a, a bit to learn when there's a standalone game and you get into the ground with half an hour or forty minutes before the game starts, and mm-hmm. you've got you've you've literally got nothing. You're sitting there and Absolutely. twiddling your thumbs or you know talking to your mates or whatever the case may be. Anyway, we best move on because we've got a last couple of minutes. Wait, of wait, six, six, news. Six, just before we do, are you telling me you don't like talking to me for thirty minutes before kickoff? <laughs> Is this hey, you making an admission to me? <laughs> you, you know that I'm guilty of having verbal diarrhea at the best of times. <laughs> I never pass up opportunities for a chat. Yeah, or chin waggle. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, we move on to the last couple of bits of NRL news. Uh, looks like Luciano Lua wants an early release, maybe to join the Dragons. John, what can you tell us yeah, about that? Yeah, breaking story today. Um, we don't have full details as of yet because of it, but it looks like Leilua wants out of the Cowboys franchise to uh, get a release elsewhere. And it's not specified it's the Dragons uh, directly, but it is tipped that it is the Dragons. So they continue their recruitment drive under Flanagan. Um, yeah, Leilua, has he seen out a contract anywhere yet? No, I, don't, I was about to ask the same question. I don't think no. he has. Yeah, so and that, didn't he, did he start at the Dragons? Wasn't that where he... Yeah, not at all. Yeah, so yep. coming full circle for Luciano. Look, the drag, the dragons, the Cowboys have a stocked back row as well, and he probably sees the sort of cards being played out that way. But he is going to be on the bench. They've got uh, Hill and Lukey, uh, the or- Queens and Origin player. Uh, God, uh, Nanai. Yeah, J- uh, Jeremiah Nanai or Nane, uh alongside Tamalolo at lock forward. So, and his Le- Layla was not a lock forward, obviously. So he probably sees the uh, you know the writing on the wall in that regard. Um, and you know, coming to Dragons, he's going to be a certified starter there. So no surprise that he's asking out, even if there is a pattern of behaviour there. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure who else would be interested, but the Dragons are definitely yeah. keen to recruit under Flanagan. We know that. Okay. The Cowboys yeah. also have a um, have a, a young back rower, um, Fene Fuiake. Yes, who, who made a bit of a name for himself. Really great prospect, mm-hmm. and who's currently off contract. And you know, I actually think that this is a potentially big win for the Cowboys yeah, because he's on, you can get an expensive player off the. Layla came to them on a boater contract. Yeah, so 
Yeah, and and they can likewise keep Luki and Fini Fuiake, um up there uh, on, on top of Nanai and and Tom Alolo. I, I, this this might be a case in in uh, for both the Cowboys and the Dragons that it's a it's a win all round. And Clint, we finish the NRL news with something that's maybe a bit of a surprise because for a while Bradman Best was rumoured to be on the outer at Newcastle, despite his form that there was a chance he could end up at another club, but now he's re-signed until the end of 2027. So yeah, it appears to be um, for uh, $2 million uh, across the length of the contract. So, you know, um, doing some quick math there, that kind of leaves him with the devil's number there and the 666 repeater um, um, per year, if you were to average it across the three years, I'm sure it's a, it's um, like all NRL contracts these days. It's um, there's a CPI component to it, or at least a, a staggered component to it that increases year on year um, along with the salary cap. But you know, um, it's kind of been a um, a bit of a 180 from where Bradman Best was um, uh, 12 months ago. You know, there was talk of him leaving the club as he suggested their 60s, and you know, him maybe not necessarily being in the best of graces up there, and and possibly not. Um, playing to his wage, but you know, um, a, a very um, successful uh, back of, of year for the Newcastle Knights, and and Bradman Best obviously being called up to State of Origin has uh, obviously seen um, his tenure there extended and um, and his salary increase. And you've got to say it's a deserved salary increase. But uh, would I pay that much for Bradman Best? Probably not if I was managing uh, NRL salary cap, but. You know, the market demands, and, and, and he's certainly hot on the market right now. Um, Newcastle probably would have had to have paid market rate in order to keep him there. Um, if he can continue to uh, produce the form that he did at the back end of last year, then, you know, it's it's a good deal for everyone. You know, I think he's being remunerated fairly and, and probably being um, uh, earning a fair wage against the, the, the salary cap from uh, Knights Ross's perspective as well. But, yeah, you know, look, it's... Um, it, it's an interesting 180 that's evolved over these last 12 months for Bradman. Yeah, absolutely. Now, fellas, oh, that... b- before we before we wrap up, um, just want to say I think we read the tea leaves wrong last week. Um, we all had Joey Manu, st- Joey Manu, Joey Manu, staying with the Roosters uh, to a T, I think. But the indication is that he might be joining French rugby, and I think that Angus Crichton might have given the Roosters the same uh, indication. Mm. So neither are done and dusted, but. Maybe some uh, monumental, some uh, you know, seismic shakeups over in Bondi. Well, what we know is that Nick Politis won't sit on having either a that much money freed up without having a big name coming in to replace one or both mm. players. Yeah, and uh, they did secondly. Also... I was going to say, they did also re-sign Luke Curie, which was a surprise to me, given uh, his mm. issues of concussion, but there you go. Yeah, it's, look, it's I, I, don't, within... I don't see it being a problem. I don't see them having a long-term problem. They'll they'll come to a solution and no, look no, out right, yeah. the clubs yeah. because they'll find someone to mm. replace those players. And, and, and that's the worry, right? You know, it's it's within the rest of the, the other 16 NRL clubs' best interest that they actually retain um, the likes of of Manu and and Crichton in that instance, because it means they don't have money available um, to uh, potentially pick off other players. You know, the, the Roosters pull off recruiting miracles when it looks like they've got tight cap management or, 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 or limited funds available. What about them now when it's quite obvious that they will have an open wallet? Yeah, it's a scary prospect, and I'm sure all player managers out there uh, probably. <laughs> Um, getting ready to hit Nick on speed dial and let yep. them know, let him know who's available in the near future. Fellas, thank you for tonight. Thank you for, and listeners, you're probably going to be getting this in the morning or early afternoon tomorrow. But fellas, thank you for this podcast. Thank you to all of our listeners out there, uh, especially those that reach out and send us a hello or a a message of some sort. We really do appreciate that. Thank you, of course, to our sponsors, Big Swing Golf at Northmead and Star Partners Real Estate, Auburn, Norellan and Parramatta. Their support is, it's fundamental to what we, what we do here. It's, we, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without the support. 
And look, we have to keep mentioning this because it's vitally important. The voting for the directors of Parramatta Leagues Club, it's open now, but time is ticking away. Voting closes at 5 p.m. Friday, the 23rd of February. So that's not this Friday. It's the following Friday. And that's going to happen sooner than you know it. If you're sitting on your vote, if you haven't voted as yet, please, it's only going to take you a couple of minutes electronically. Uh, even if you received it in the post and you've got access to the internet, get your voting papers, log on. It's a, As I said, it's a two-minute process to vote. Make sure you get that done and uh, just, yeah, just vote because voting gives the more people that vote, it gives that um, real true reflection of the wishes of members and that's really critical. So get out there and, of course, again, repeating our good news that we are going to be making appearances in, Para in Jack's in Parramatta Leagues Club for the 2024 season and that will kick off in round one against the Canterbury when Parramatta take on the Canterbury Bulldogs. We look forward to seeing you there in Jack's Bar and Grill. Stand by for information on that and who our legend will be. Uh, in the meantime, as I always say, go you mighty eels.